Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Bobcast. With you, as always, is Bob, live in the lounge, staring at the Ouija board. It's Halloween, ladies and gentlemen, and it's my favorite time of the year. Spooks, goblins, witches, werewolves everywhere. It's a night of macabre, if you will. One of the things I loved the most growing up was the 1978 original film, Halloween. It scared the shit out of me as a kid. I thought Michael Myers was real, and I thought he was coming to get me after I saw it for the first time. Thanks, Dad, for showing it to me at the tender age of five or six. It has affected me for most of my adult life. So in about a year ago, I heard that they were going to reboot the Halloween series. I was more than happy to follow it with just... Uh, I, I'll tell you flat out right off the bat, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I didn't watch any of the trailers. And we're going to get into that. Tonight's guest... He's actually appearing tonight uh, for the fourth or fifth time, and I just realized that uh, he's been on the podcast uh, digitally through the phone more times than I've actually met him in real life. Uh, so this is a, a first for the Bobcast. He's a fantastic guitar player. He owns Brett Mann's Sound Studio. He is an amazing guitar player. He was the guitar player for Ike for the better part of a couple years in Philadelphia, and now he's just, uh, you know, making his own tunes, doing his own thing, producing albums. He did an awesome Monster Mash cut-up a couple weeks ago. Uh, welcome back to the show, Mr. Brett Talley, here on the Bobcast. Turn the lights off. All right, Mr. Brett Talley here on the show. Welcome back. Uh, we used the bat signal. It took, over, I guess, like a better part of like what two years of tracking this film. Here we are, right off the right off the bat. First, let me just say, Happy Halloween. How are you doing? Happy Halloween. You know, it's my favorite time of year. It's it's my favorite time of year too. I feel the most alive in the month of October. Amen to that. So the film Halloween, right? I mean, like you and I both share, you know, a, a mild obsession with the film. I would say so. Right off the bat, tell me, you know, just tell me how you feel, because I've avoided all social, me social media on your, like, review. How did you feel about the film? First, like, the, the beginning scene with the smash cut to Halloween and the recomposing pumpkin, what were your thoughts? I love that. At first, it kind of took me off guard when I saw cut? it. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, this is pretty cool. It, it's almost like they're bringing the franchise back to life, like, you know it's rising back. So I was like, Oh, okay. I, I kind of dig this. <laughs> so, I definitely dug that. Yeah. I, I thought it was great. I, th I love how, uh, it, it reminded me like of the nine inch nails video. Uh, yeah. what, what, is that hurt when the dog comes back to life? Right. I yeah. Think, and yeah. Like, and everything is decaying and then yeah, it, back. it looked yeah. great. I like how in the beginning, the pumpkin, like it was really decayed and then it grew back a bit. Yeah. And then there was like this, like maybe extended 30 seconds where it's like, Oh, it's, it takes even longer for the pumpkin to come back up. Right. It must have been then, like when the pumpkin was like going through like Halloween, like, you know, the curse of Michael Myers or something like that. It just took forever <laughs> to get through. You and then I, I mean? loved like once it was uh, fully inflated, it was the pumpkin from the original movie, which I really thought was cool. Which is great. Yeah. So but, um, that, it was interesting too that to me that like, I mean, as a filmmaker, like, you know, scriptwriter, like the way that they started it with us, we were right back where Michael was. Um, uh, 40 years ago he, he was in the same institution that broke out with Loomis and now we learn he's been back there and these yeah. podcasters come right and we've yep. all seen the trailers you know and uh, you know he, he slams that mask in his face and he starts screaming say something I was like oh my god this feels like a hammer film or something like it, it just yeah. had this like edgy vibe to it right off the bat like the worst podcaster ever like you're screaming in this serial killer's face like are you sure are you sure you want to be doing this like, and, <laughs> don't and he's like stepping like very close to the yellow line yeah uh, the box and, and the, the thing about that too that it was once i left the theater and thought about it for a while it's like the podcasters really served no purpose other than to get him his mask <laughs> at the end of the day 
that's all they were good for. <laughs> and also, they needed gas in their car because if they didn't need gas, Michael never gets the trademark. You know, correct. He otherwise maybe he winds up at like. I don't know, Burger King. He's in a Burger King like employee's outfit. It would never work. Right. We need him in the gas station attendant uniform. Exactly. But I, the, the I, other... I do know what you mean about the podcasters. I, I read some stuff online that um, suggested that, you know, the same thing that they could just be written out completely and it'd, it'd yeah. be the same film. Right. I'm sure there was a more clever way to get around all that. And plus, since we're like on that scene, even in the trailer, there were some scenes in the trailer that weren't in the finished film with the female podcaster, like in the shower and you see like behind her, like Michael appears. So I was curious to see what that take was. Um, but cause that's not in the finished film. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, Oh, that could have been a f- like a real dumb jump scare where it was the male podcaster wearing the mask to freak her out. I, I, I read some of that as well. Okay. I also read something that was a report that people were mad at uh, as far as like a podcast goes. Like they would never use that specific type of microphone because it would never work or something. <laughs> that people like hating on it from all sorts of angles. Oh my god! Um, I, I didn't. I didn't mind the podca- podcasters as much as the first scene where I was just like, "Oh man, come on!" It's like when they're at the grave gravesite for Judith oh. Myers. And, right. uh, you know, they're standing there and the, the person who took him to the grave, like she looks over and sees, you know, Myers behind the tree looking all sorts of creepy. And it's just a, a cut to they don't like right. basically like, you know, like, who the hell's that? Right. But, I mean, the escape like the way. OK, so spoilers right off the bat, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen Halloween, don't listen to this. Delete me <laughs> as your friend because we're going to get into the spoilers. So, I mean, right off the bat, we have to talk about the doc, the new Dr. Loomis. Right. Because in the beginning scene. Oh, yeah. For me, I have to see this film again completely to 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 enjoy it because, I mean, spoiler alert, yep, he is the one who gets Michael out of jail, technically. Right. I mean, like, or, you know, from the mental institution to the bus, he gets him right. out of the bus because he sits in the front seat. We are shown this pen within the first three minutes of the, the film. It's mm-hmm. his pen that he uses to stab Officer Hawkins later. And right. we, we stay on it for just a brief second. And that was the director's, you know, be like, hey, here it is. Here's your one clue you're going to get. <laughs> Were you surprised by the big reveal at the end? Or, excuse me, like in the Dark Knight of the, the Soul part of the script? The, you're talking about like the twist with the doc. Yeah, with the twist with the doc. Or the yeah. Doc's like, I, I'll tell you what. I, I loved the idea that the doctor let him out and like crashed the bus just to see what he would do. That part I thought was pretty cool. What I didn't like was the out of nowhere kill on the sheriff. I just thought that was yeah, completely so, so, so unnecessary. Yeah, I, when it initially happened for me, my brother and I both shared the same sentiment. We were just like, "Oh no, please." Yes. This is right. this is not happening right now. Is this like right. some sort of throwback to like the cur- yeah. the the cult of Michael Myers with them being right. become possessed? There's no way that the doc's gonna be Michael Myers when he goes down for the final countdown. Right. Like, for a moment there, I'm and like, w- how is old man strength Myers gonna survive the the, fuck, <laughs> the knee buckling fucking car crash? You know, like right. Which we'll get into later because I have a theory about that. But okay. um. You know, like, it took me by surprise. And I didn't even really put two and two together until after I left the theater, full disclosure. And I'm just sitting there Mm -hmm. thinking, like, he crashed the bus. He was sitting in the front seat. He stabbed that dude, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I loved loved all that stuff. It was great. Um, That scene was great. Yeah. I mean, the the car crash scene, too, played out totally different in my mind than, like, when I saw the trailer... I imagine we saw how it happened, like, I guess, like, in The Fugitive. You know how you saw oh. Dr. Richard Kimball oh, or yeah. something like that? So right. I, I was kind of excited that it was, like, a mystery box. Like, well, how did it happen, you know? Right, which I kind of I found cool, too, because that was, like, a throwback to the original when Loomis first gets to Smith's Grove and all the patients are just out wandering. You know, you never really find out how that happened, you know, like how they got out or escaped. Yeah. Um, But I, I got nervous because when he stands up, and new Loomis has the mask on. I was like, oh, no. I know. I'm like, yeah. is, this, is this where it's going? Like, he's going to become the new Myers? And at first I was like, is this cool? And then I was like, wait a minute. This, 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 this dude's I don't, five foot like, seven. He's five foot seven. There's no way he could be. Right. Yeah. And then I'm like, they're not setting up this big confrontation with Laurie 
to be from a guy she met five minutes ago. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, you knew it. You knew he was coming back, but I just felt like that whole plot was just really. I mean, they could have just left it. In my opinion, that you know the doctor orchestrated the bus crash, got him out, and then like that would come out later in the film that he was the one that caused the crash and like set up this drama between him and the sheriff and yeah maybe if we got like a hint that it was going on before the scene reveal right was the, yeah that would have been interesting but i mean like i guess from a storytelling point of view it did it did surprise me it's it was a big surprise of the film yes. for me that this actually happened in a halloween film i'm like okay the, yeah the doc Jesus, the duck. Yeah. And then he's talking about like releasing Michael into a controlled like environment, like an experiment. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting angle. Is right. this dude going to be involved now in the mythology? And then I was completely ecstatic when Michael had the most glorious death scene. I think, in my opinion, of the whole film is when he bashed his head in into the yeah. asphalt. I thought we were getting into Rob Zombie Halloween territory with that uh, kill. And, and honestly, that was one of the things that I really didn't like about the film was the gore i mean uh, out of all the halloween films you know i think everyone agrees the best one and my favorite is the original and part of the charm of the original is there really is no gore like at all and it was more about the suspense and i felt like that was not needed in the new film you know for a film that was really relying heavily on the past you know and honoring the original I felt like it was going backwards. You know, with it, the yeah, it did take some uh, some liberties with itself. I do agree with you on that. I mean, but I guess at the same time, they were, he, they were trying to honor all the movies. Yeah, the, you know, I, and that's that's an odd thing about this film is that I think it's the first of its kind where it really does it in an intelligent kind of way. I don't know if necessarily they had to do every single little Easter egg <laughs> they did. You know what I mean? Like, right. Right. But there were so many of them like scattered throughout. I mean, like the season of the witch masks. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it, that just, was great. It's cool. There's cool things like littered throughout. I mean, like also too, like the the symbology between certain s- scenes. I mean, like I, I'm so happy that they didn't, you know, uh, spoil the the great uh, Laurie Strode being uh, the boogeyman outside the English class window. Yeah, that to me yeah. was just awesome. That was that was fantastic, and I love that you know she's sitting in the same desk, you know the the same topic is being discussed by the teacher. I loved all that stuff. Like what a reversal of you know, the hunted has now become like the hunter, and she's taking on this persona. I I, I thought that was great. That was like some of my favorite stuff of the film, and you know, towards the end oh, when yeah. she goes over the balcony and she's gone. I was like, people were clapping in the theater when same, that happened. Same, same. I'm so happy. I saw it on Friday night with a, like a packed crowd to mm-hmm. get the reaction of it. It was, it was uh, an experience. I'm glad it wasn't just like, you know, a half empty place. Cause it's always fun to see something like that with the audience and yeah. like the, the jokes that work and then the jokes that don't work, you know? Like, yeah. Right. There were some the... jokes I remember that just fell flat and I was just like, Oh man, nobody, nobody got that. And then you could totally tell when Danny McBride was writing certain dialogue yeah, absolutely. Especially um, with the the, the, uh, the, the kid that's being yeah. Oh yeah, that too. And Peanut butter on my dick line. I mean, like <laughs> I, that's that's McBride straight out of uh, this is oh, the yeah. end. But it was interesting, yeah. you know, how they showed the the, the multi layered family aspects of the Strode family. I I, I really liked Laurie Strode. I mean, I thought Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, did a great job. I I wish that she, the performance though was the type of performance like Sylvester Stallone had in Creed that could have got her nominated for an Academy Award. She does right. have two good scenes in the film that I thought were fantastic. The one is where, you know, she says, I saw him, the shape, when she's, like, breaking down at the, the dinner table with her daughter. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, like, I wish that it was that type of film, though, but it wasn't. So it's like, I like the I love the film, you know, like, I want to see it again, but it's definitely not without some stakes. But, I mean, it was better than all the ones we've had before, I think. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when I came out of the theater, you know, my initial reaction was, oh, my, you know, I loved it. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, ah, oh, this kind of bothered me and this kind of bothered me. So, like, I gave it an 8 out of 10. But I definitely think it's one of the best sequels in the series. Um, I thought the music was the best the music has been since oh, yeah. the first one. Um, so, overall, I really like I'm, I'm in the same boat. I want to see it again. Because I got to see that it I, again, yeah. Yeah, now that I know, like, I got my expectations out of the way and I digested it a little bit, you know, I got to take in the soundtrack a little bit more. And then I've been reading 
you know, every interview and watching every behind the scenes thing I can but, um, since then. So I'm like, yeah, now I want to go back and appreciate more, appreciate it more on like a filmmaking level. And, um, you know, kind of just now, just kind of getting rid of all the things that I know I didn't dig and just go in for the things that I really loved about it. But I definitely want to see it again. And I went on the, uh, the Thursday night mm -hmm. and saw it in uh, Dolby Atmos and when that music kicked in, I was like, oh, my God, I'm in I'm in nerd heaven right now. This is like the best thing ever. I, I swear to God. And I'm that guy. You know this. Like I started filling up. I had a single tear fall down. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Halloween time. Here we go. And yeah, I, I definitely had that feeling too, as well. I mean, my, uh, yeah. my, the movie theater that I was in, it just had it was radiating with energy, and like uh, I really liked the additions, especially from you know you're a musician as well, so you can appreciate it. It's, uh, it's John Carpenter's son that's making these additions to the soundtrack. That that vi yeah. the violin bow on the distorted, reverberated guitar. Uh, so good. Oh my god, I love that. Well, the, yeah, I would. When it comes to like um, the score. The two new pieces I loved, and it reminded me, it was kind of Goblin esque, like Suspiria was this like new synth thing, and then that part that you're talking about that comes in, and I listened to the soundtrack again tonight. I, the first time it happens is when um, Michael's st stalking the granddaughter Allison, and I think on the soundtrack it's called "The Shape Chases Allison," or, and then it comes it comes back again when they're in the house at the end and on the soundtrack it's called the grind and that whole new music I, that was like if you if you asked me like what are my favorite thing from the film is it's that that piece of music <laughs> music is great the, that with the imagery of what's going on at the end and like the tension and that that bow just going in the background and it's like it's got this like distorted sustained guitar like in the background i was like oh my god this is this is perfect. That was perfect. And how, and how cool for Carpenter. You know, he makes the original in 78, does the music himself, and then here we are, like, 40 years later, and he's doing the score, you know, with Jamie Lee Curtis in the movie, and he gets to do the score with his son this time. Like, I, that to me is, like, an amazing story, like, just outside of the film. What's like, even more cool amazing is from. is from that podcast that you and I have been listening to, the Halloween Unmasked one. They shot the film in 22 days. It was called the Babysitter, Babysitter Murders. Uh, he didn't really want to make a horror film. He wanted to make cowboy films. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like he's going to be forever known for this, like you know, small segment of time, like literally twenty. The, the film made in that short amount of time, that like volume of you know, like it's just really an intelligent. Everything came together. Deborah Hill, the script, the shape. And then, like, 40 yeah. years later, you know, I mean, there's not any other franchise, really, I could think that could, you know, produce as many sequels. I mean, right. I guess Friday... I, I heard Friday the 13th is getting uh, produced now by LeBron James. Oh, so, my God. So, uh, LeBron James's film company is trying to get a realistic, grounded take on Jason Voorhees. Because now that uh, Michael's back in the ring, everybody's trying to get a piece. Right. Oh, but... No, th no thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, too, like, you know, I got to see it again because I want to watch it from the doctor's perspective i want to watch it from his point of view like manipulating right. everybody mm -hmm. especially in the beginning like he was saying like all this shit i can't remember like you know parts of it because uh in the beginning was just so overwhelming i couldn't believe that it was right. happening finally you know yeah but exactly. he's like he's alluding to stuff in the beginning too like these little snide remarks that are like you know in mm -hmm. favor of michael and i found that fascinating you know and like right i i found if i was uh i was listening to the slash film cast review of the movie earlier today and they made a really good point and it's something i thought about like in the movie but then i quickly just was like god ah, don't be thinking like that that's not this kind of movie but i found it funny that this doctor has been studying this one guy for 40 years and the guy doesn't talk right the patient doesn't talk what all are you studying for 40 years like <laughs> I, like yeah. 40 years you wasted your career when the guy doesn't talk and like he's he, you're obsessed with him like what I, are you I, doing I, for it was years? It, I, that's why i think it was such a shock when the doc stabbed officer hawkins who apparently too mm -hmm. was uh the one who stopped dr loomis from killing michael did you did you notice that new addition to the mythology 
Wait, what was say that again? So they say in the film that Officer Hawkins, the dude, the doctor, yeah. the gr- the grown man, you know, mm-hmm. um, he they he the I, I can't remember who says the line in the film, but they do say that this officer was the one who showed up and stopped Loomis from killing oh, Michael at the scene of the, yeah. crime of the original Halloween. Yeah, I did catch that, which I found interesting. Who who said that exactly? Because I can't recall. Um. Oh God, I'm trying to remember. I remember was it the Dr. line. What's it? His name's Doctor Sartan, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was it him yeah. that said it? Because he would probably know that privy. But I mean, like that was just an interesting choice, you know. To I, I, for the people out there who've never listened to any podcast about Halloween, they were going to reshoot the ending of the '78 original film for this mm. and change up the mythology with, I guess, CGI Loomis, which would have been awesome. Yeah, I was. I mean, especially when you look at the way Marvel is de-aging characters and it, it looks incredible i imagine they probably could have did something comparable something but um, you know maybe he'll come back it'd be great <laughs> if they yeah. did a prequel like you know uh and i read too in an interview that they found a stand-up comedian that would do donald pleasant's impressions and that's the guy that's doing the uh luma's voice in the new film I did. I did look that up because I was curious. I was like, <laughs> "Wait a minute, is this like some sort of alternate take from Carpenters?" Right. But yeah, right. I mean, now that's a thing too. Now apparently, which, I mean, so that happened also too in um, Infinity. Like, remember with uh, the Red Skull, Ross Mar- Marquand's oh. playing him. Yeah. Right. So like, I used to think that that type of thing though was illegal because of the Back to the Future lawsuit with Crispin Glover. Because he wasn't in part two, so he sued Steven Spielberg and the companies and stuff. And there was a right. clause, I guess. But I guess in today's age, anybody, any actor can be, you know, bought. <laughs> yeah, true. But I do, like, I, I love the fact that, you know, how we meet Jamie. Like, you know, she's, like, suffering p- from PTSD and, like, the guns. And she seems so much different than what we last saw her in H2O. Or if you want to even count Resurrection, but... How, right. how do you feel about Resurrection? Do you think it still holds up? Or, excuse me, uh, um, or H2O. H2O. Yeah, yeah um, in terms of, like, favorites of the franchise, for me, it goes 1, 2, and then H2O, um, and then 4. I have a special place in my heart for 4. 4 um, is dark. Yeah, I, I love, and f- it, actually, Halloween 4 still, in my opinion, has the best opening credits of any Halloween film. It just sets up the mood perfectly yeah. i always thought that um return of michael myers is a great halloween film with a horrible mask <laughs> horrible mask it's the worst horrible mask. the choices the they made for the masks after two you know mm-hmm. I, I, it, it baffles me especially the one in <laughs> h2o because it looks yeah. like somebody who like you know has had plastic surgery and lives in like beverly hills or something like that it's just right. it's terrible <laughs> the cheekbones change there's cgi in the film yeah, uh, Halloween 35th anniversary DVD has like something on there that goes into detail about how they could never get the mask correct, and it's yeah. just a mess, like a total mess. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah. I did dig this mess, you know. And I, yeah. I was part of this Halloween definitely. face group, Facebook group uh, throughout the summer leading it, up to the film, and like all these people were getting their masks, I guess, in the mail like a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, and they were all disappointed because it didn't right. look like the you know the one used in the film, so they were yeah. painting them and stuff. Did well, you get a mask? Um, yeah. Well, here's this is the here this is the best thing. So, uh, going to the movie, I I have the original mask from the first film. It was, um. So I thought it'd be funny if I wore it in the car on the way to the theater. My girlfriend was driving. I thought it'd be fun just to stare at people. Got some laughs. Then I got to the theater and I was gonna go in with it, and then it hit me real quick. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna allow me in there with a mask. You know, with all the past history of you know just people shooting up theaters and i was like ah you know what maybe this isn't a good idea so i took the mask off and then i get into a packed theater the movie plays and after it's over i hear all this commotion and i look over and here here's a guy dressed as michael myers in the theater people are going crazy taking selfies with him high-fiving him and then like they push us outside of the theater all these people were coming up taking pictures of him i was so bitter because this guy had the worst, like, Myers mask. Oh, my And my, my mask was straight up legit, man. Like, I, I was like, God damn it. Damn it. I should have <laughs> brought it in. But, um, yeah, I it was funny. I did, um, 
for Halloween this year, I did a cover of Monster Mash, and I did a little Halloween parody, and I had a mask that was the mask from H2O, and when I moved, something happened in the box I had it in, and it kind of melted horribly, so I had to go get a new mask, so I'm at Spirit Halloween, and I have the new mask from the new movie in front of me, and then there was the original mask. And I'm like, oh, man, which one do I do? Because they both look so cool. But, you know, I, I had to go original. So I got the original mask. But now I'm seeing all these pictures of people wearing the new mask. And I'm like, ah, oh, now I want to go get that one just to have it <laughs> and have this mask collection. But the only one I have right now is the original mask. But I wanted to wear it, but didn't do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm elated that they got the shape back i mean like the mold looks cool i mean obviously now spoilers it's burned to a crisp you know <laughs> he's <laughs> i mean but backtrack oh, that's the other thing yeah, what's the other thing tell me real quick just because it's i'm on my own how funny do you really think a district attorney's office would hand over a piece of evidence like that to a podcaster yeah but who uses an audio <laughs> recording device that's in his palm Right, I, I did right. think that you know we've got. Sorry, we've, I just we've managed I had to, to say get that this, Michael. There. It's not even in a plastic bag. It's like in his like tro. <laughs> right, it's this like, like huge evidence of this murder that happened years ago. The you DA, can yeah, sense here. it. You can sense it, Michael. <laughs> um, yep. It, it, I some people, yeah, something about him. You know, the, that part didn't bother me as much as when he first gets to Laurie Strode's house, and mm-hmm. he completely goes off the cusp. And he he's like borderline rude to her, like he he he's like almost like uh, immature to her. I forget what he says to her. And he has this like really like maniac maniac look to him when he asks her like this <sighs> question, and she was just not having it and kicking right. him out. But yeah, Strode definitely was in charge. I wish you know, I guess it's it's time to talk about this too. It's just like I wish I didn't watch any. If I didn't watch any of the trailers, this would have been the best goddamn Halloween movie I ever seen in my <laughs> life, man. Right, but I knew everything. I, uh, I knew everything because of the goddamn trailers. Yeah, and I've done and it to know, myself again now with Creed. Creed's coming, so I'm going to make a promise to myself in 2019, <laughs> right here on the Bobcast, to no longer watch trailers. Because I'm need, with you. I, I I just I have to make a promise to myself because I'm you know I'm addicted. Yeah, I'm addicted. You to know, the cinema. I, you know, I'm the same way. I try. My rule of thumb has been: I'll watch the first trailer, and then I won't watch anything that comes after. However, I broke that rule with the uh, second glass trailer that came out. Oh, that's yeah, second glass trailer is amazing. I just don't know if I can wait till January to see that movie. So I broke my rule on that one. But yeah, for Halloween, I only watched the first trailer. Um, but even that was enough. Like I knew going in that you know, Laurie was going to be Sarah Connor, and you know it looked like it was going to be the same. Set up, but I felt like you know I basically saw the movie in the trailer, which it's just the worst which, part. I mean, even like Entertainment Weekly, like you know the image they released of Laurie Strode being strangled by Michael coming through her fucking oh, front door is right. the biggest spoiler out there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's gonna get in there, but I don't need to see it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. At least and respect then, me as an audience member who's gonna pay to see these films ten times in a row. You know, over. To not right. I, like I just feel as if like they could have just shot something. You know what I mean? Like right. Case in point, I, there was a War of the Worlds trailer years ago for the Tom Cruise Steven Spielberg remake mm-hmm. that had no footage from the film. It was just a scene of people in their neighborhood, and all of a sudden, you know, the world happens. They walk out and they see the you know. Yep, I remember that. You remember that, and it really was catchy. Yeah. They did it with Godzilla yeah. years ago. Godzilla's hand crushed the Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. In New right. York Museum, shit like that. Like I mean, like uh, I remember that, the the original Cloverfield trailer was the same way. You know, it didn't really give you anything, but it was just enough like mystery where you you know I was intrigued. I was like, I need to see that. I want to know what that's about. I can't remember shit about the film I saw the night <laughs> I saw the Cloverfield trailer. That's all I thought about throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, and what I think the I said it before. That? And I, I said it before, I know, on your podcast, like one of my all-time favorite trailers was the original teaser trailer for Unbreakable. Oh, it was killer. And yeah. yeah. That's, in my opinion, that's the way it should be done. And it surprises me that they give so much away because it's a Halloween film. I know what I'm getting. Yeah, I'm I know what I'm getting. In. Like, we don't need to see Laurie Strode's, you know, rotating cabinet. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need to like see, like, the, the panic room <laughs> or the trap room. We don't need to see this shit because... Right. We know where the final, you know, 
girl, yeah. you know, we know where the showdown's going happening, and it's just like, uh, I knew the whole thing already. There's, mm-hmm. The only things I didn't know is how Michael got there, because in right. all the other ones, he's evil and he's drawn to her, but it really, by dumb luck, he kind of, like, makes his way in this film. Like, Michael, right. Michael's just totally, like, the shark, though, and Jaws, just like the director and Danny were describing him in, like, all the interviews. Shape just gets into town and just moves. Okay, so yeah. let's talk about that uh, long tracking shot. Oh, yeah. That's probably one of my favorite parts of the film. You're talking on, like, Halloween night, right, yeah. when everyone's trick-or-treating. Oh, yeah, I-, I loved it. And that, to me, captured the feel of the original. You know, like, And I loved it had a much more uh, sense of, like, Halloween with kids trick-or-treating. You know, houses were decorated more. When you go back and watch the original movie, like, you forget sometimes that it's Halloween night. It's, like, the worst decorated houses, you know. And it's like you said on that podcast, they had leaves that they just would all collect, put in a bag, mm-hmm. dump them for one. And so, that you know, it was a limited budget. But you never really get the Halloween vibe in the original movie, which in this one, I was like, oh, man, they got the feel perfect. And you know, all these houses it had It did feel like Halloween, and, yeah. It looked like it, yeah. too. You know, it had, mm-hmm. like, a good vibe. And something and, about, like, the way Michael moves, too. Like, after the two kids hit him, you know what I mean? And then like, he just oh, makes this, yeah. like, motion with his neck that's, like, so not human at all right i love that whole sequence and when he goes up to the window and he peers in and his his mouth uh his mouth his face is lit by the pumpkins and he just disappears and you see his shadow go yeah Uh, his shadow up against the walls i said that to my brother too i was like that that had to be like the best for me it's just like that spooky shit because they do that in the original where you see a shadow coming around the building and i love the way Mm -hmm. that looked and like of course, like the main controversy of this whole sequence too is after he kills his first victim, he stalks the second, uh, the shadow uh, on the wall, and then he overlooks the baby. Uh, which I loved, and I'll tell you why. Because I think that's something in the film that is set up early on and it plays out. Because one of the scenes that really got me is the scene with the father and the son in the car when they come upon the bus. Like, he straight up kills the kid. And right there, I was like, whoa, they are going, like, all out on this one. They're breaking, so that's, yeah. They're, they're doing and then, new new, uh, new ideas. Yeah, like, here. I was just like, holy shit, he just killed a kid. And then you get to the scene in the house, and he comes upon the baby. And they've already set you up to the fact that he'll kill a kid. So my heart was in my stomach. I'm like, oh, my God, is he going to kill a baby right now? Like, are we going there? And then he doesn't do it. And I feel like, oh, that was so awesome. That was such a payoff to how we were set up earlier with him with the kid. So that was like one of my favorite parts of the film. I was Because my intensity there, I was like, holy shit, are we going here? Yeah, yeah <laughs> then, that's how I felt too. Uh, for When the kid gets out of the truck and the dad, you know, goes the other way, there's this one great sequence with the kid too where like the trucks are blinding us in the background and he's in the foreground with the gun. Yeah. He's looking out there, and like it has, it was like a tense moment in the theater where people don't, they don't like to be in a scene like that where they can't see what's in front or in back of them. I right. think they did, they did it in the original Halloween too. I thought it was a good. They used the camera quite a bit too for the scares. But mm-hmm. um, when he got back in the car too, it was also you know a total uh, throwback to the classic you know car sequence where you know the the windows are all fogged up. And like mm-hmm. the imagery of the shape in the back seat, and yeah, I was shocked. You know, they killed him. I was like, the, yeah. In my pop culture brain, though, I mean, <laughs> instantaneously, my uh, reaction was reasoning for it. It was like, oh, he's like the predator. He was armed. <laughs> he had to be taken <laughs> out. He's a threat. Right. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, I, it shocked me though. I was just like, holy shit, I can't and believe that's gone this far. And that's one thing I love with the new film is I feel like. They made Michael menacing again, you know? Like, I legit, every time he was on screen, I was, like, on edge. I was like, man, this is great. I haven't felt like Michael, you know? And the Rob Zombie films, he's just brutal. You know, he's a lot quicker, especially in Halloween, too, with Rob Zombie's version. Yeah, he's he's, like, he's like the Incredible Hulk so Michael brutal. Myers in that. Exactly, yeah. And that kind of, like, took it, you know, took me out of the movie because, like, I just saw him as, like, this huge wrestling guy. Yeah just smashing people in the mirror is like uh what was i think the one like uh stripper in that yeah, halloween too they, like he she... really went full rob zombie in that one oh you know I mean? yeah like, it, it is totally out there like from start to finish but in this one it you know i love he's just like a 70 year old man and you know he's not big he just 
does what he does. That to me is what Michael Myers is. You know, he's not this big hulking guy. It's just this normal guy in that suit and just walking around doing his thing. So I feel like that got that aspect of Michael Myers perfect in the new movie. Like I, I, I loved Michael Myers in this movie, especially towards the end. There, there was a the cinematography in this movie is great too. But one of my favorite shots is at the end when they have him trapped. The room's burning around him, and he's just standing still, just staring up with the flames, like, just raging behind him. I was like, oh, my God, I want that as my screensaver. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Like, man, I should take my phone out to get oh. a picture of this shit real quick. Yeah. But- there's a there's a, there's a a shot, too. I forget what scene it is. I think it's with the doctor or the cop, but it's a camera angle on – like on the street looking up at Michael and the trees are just all black in the background and the cop lights are just blinking red and blue on him and the camera oh just God. lingers on it. I was like, oh my God. I'm like, look at that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, they really did a good job framing the shots. Mm-hmm. And I think some of the, the like the same staff that worked on this film also worked on like Vice Principals on HBO. Like mm-hmm. it's crazy like how the, this crew came together too and I like how Danny McBride said, you know, I'm an underdog. Granted, there were some jokes that didn't go over well, but I mean, like, for the most part, I thought, I, I, first off, I thought the kid with the babysitter was hysterical. Yeah, I'm I su- loved him, too. I'm surprised that they didn't pump anything into, well, I guess they really couldn't do it in advertisements because of his language, which was funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I thought all that his was stuff interesting, was too, great. how they played off the babysitters, too. Like, they fit that right into Act Two, where they were like, all right, we're going to pay homage again to the original. Yeah. The boyfriends, um, the marijuana smoking. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. And this I time it like was dry the, humping. It wasn't sex, though. Right. And I was talking to my friend the other day about the movie, and one of the things he said to me that I hadn't even really thought about is he loved it, the fact that in this movie the kids were very believable and, you know, they weren't all Brad Pitt lookalikes or, you know. Yeah, they looked like kids. They looked like, yeah, like normal kids. And, like, I liked the fact that the, that boyfriend, like, he came back in, you know, to see. Like, he did, kinda, yeah. Like, Helper, and I love the payoff of that. Like, you don't see what happened. You just see the aftermath, and that's all you need to see. You know what I mean? Can you imagine... So, wait, in the original trailer, did you get spoiled when Michael was in the closet where the girl was trying to shut the door? Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think so. That part... Were you surprised in the theater with when Michael was in the closet? Yeah, because I th- uh, I don't I don't know if that was in the original trailer or not. Uh, if it, if see, it, this is what I'm saying. I'm never watching trailers again because yeah. I, I really and wish I could have experienced was, that in real time. You know what I mean? If it was, if it was, I completely forgot about it because, like I said, like I'll watch a trailer once and then I'll try to stay away. Um, I figured that's what was going to happen, but the way it was done, it, it was great, and I love the homage to the original movie with him, um, with the uh, the girlfriend wearing the sheet. As like the ghost, mm-hmm. the ghost sheet. Like I, I loved all that. It, it's funny because that to me, it's like shows that Michael Myers has this almost macabre sense of humor. You know what I mean? He really does. Like, yeah, he has a sick twist. He's also an artist too, as well. We should talk about that. We also right. were treated to uh, another Michael Myers original piece with the the police officer's face hollowed out with his flashlight in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I forgot about that until you just said that. <laughs> He's an artist. So in the first one, I mean, with uh, with uh, is it Bob? Yeah, he puts Bob against the wall. <laughs> yeah. And then he cocks his head for the first time admiring his work. He really, mm-hmm. I mean, to do that, to like, you know, take out somebody's insides and come up with that and spend the time. Right. It, it's, it's some dark shit, you know. It's also plus, dark that like, he only does shit like that when he's like out there with the mask, with the shape. Yeah. And he's just dead inside if he doesn't have his mask. And the way he sets up the bed with the Judas Myers oh, yeah. the gravestone yeah. on the bed. And I always found it funny. Like, what did he have to go through to get Bob in the closet in the first movie that when Laurie opens it, he just swings down? Yeah. Like, I would love to know so the make- contorted. There's, He's super strong. <laughs> yeah. he's That's super the Michael strong. Myers. I want to see that scene, like him configuring the body. Yeah, so him, would, him like making the shapes with the body. Like, do you do you think he tested it out first? He was like, "Let me try it and see if this works the way I want it to." And then he does I'm some like, strange. He does some strange stuff. <laughs> I, I like how he's you know, and especially in this film though, he really he was unpredictable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he, he was mm-hmm. like dangerous. He was unpredictable, but I mean, he also was suspect to 
injury and Laurie Strode catches up to him and she she I, I like that too how it was just easy for her she was using the police scanner she tracked him down she had the weapons she had you know her panic room um she knew her weapons well the great sequence mm. too where she scares her daughter like gotcha <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah I do like I, how she she there was such great moments too where she like called back to like the seventy eight she did it with the, her granddaughter once where she was talking about I think she was uh, in journalism too where she she was good in school she was alluding to and she was like the schoolgirl seventy eight version for a moment mm-hmm. that's the stuff yeah. that I think she, it could have like won an Oscar if it just didn't do I don't think they would ever give an Oscar to somebody's head getting smashed <laughs> or um, how about the ladies the the, the knife through the the throat in the long tracking sequence. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that was like, brutal. See, yeah, and that 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 was very CGI'd. That was like one thing where I thought like I didn't need to see that. They could have did something else where, you know, the camera panned up and you just saw like yeah, they could have just cut f- it. Yeah, I mean that that's just me, but that, that, I mean, but that whole take, I'm not gonna let that ruin that. I, I bet you that's like me. Miramax. Miramax is like, all right, we got these notes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna right. have to have at least a few of these be really bloody <laughs> you know what i mean right. like, and if you can somehow put a mechanical spider in there that would be great yeah that'd be great if you if you wouldn't mind the last son of krypton dying yeah. from a mechanical spider <laughs> having will smith celebrate his 50th birthday jumping out of a plane into the wiry mouth <laughs> uh, yeah. of this creature but it's yeah, like, uh, you it, know what kind of movie we're making here, right, buddy? <laughs> I guess I mean like you have to be, you know, there has to be notes from from them all. I mean, it was it was oh, not, yeah. like I only heard that Blumhouse was doing the whole thing. I didn't know anything until Universal and Miramax popped up in the beginning, and then there's I think there's another attached company as well. But is that the first film that like Miramax has done in a while? Like I don't remember. So the rights, thing, it's, so I know that Jason has the rights right now to it, so he can make the films. But the other okay. ones help distribute it. So they're not the ones who are producing it, but they're like distribution somehow. So they help okay. the, the the film get into different theaters throughout the country, I think, is like their job. Yeah, that's but, the first time I remember seeing Miramax before a movie in a long time. Or long maybe time. I'm wrong. Yeah, or maybe I'm just yeah, I'm watching the wrong I, movies, but I just didn't recall that. Neither do I. That's something we, we could um, research, but I think you may be right. I remember there was Miramax Dimensions back in the day. I think that was like yeah. their sub label or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that was Scream, right? Wasn't Scream mm-hmm. done through that? Okay. And a lot of people were. I was reading a lot of reviews. People were like bringing that movie up too. Like, well, you can't do the traditional slasher because of films like Scream. And I'm like, Scream is not a classic, man. Somebody, mm-hmm. you want to come at me on Facebook? Go ahead. Yeah. It, Scream's a good movie, but it's not a classic. It's it's like a spoof you know what? of like what I'm, came before. I'm with I'm you. A, fans of spoofs you know what i mean i'm a fan of like originality some might yeah. argue it was original but i mean i just it's not something i look forward to watching <laughs> you know what yeah I mean? no like, I, i'm with you 100 percent. i never really understood the love and critical acclaim that scream got and i'm with you it's a good film i watch it but you know it's not one i always refer to as you know, one of the best slasher films out there. No, not our... at all. Not at all. I mean, yeah, I'm with watch you. Watch Black Friday, if you, you know, stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. different types of films that came before. But I just don't like when people, like, make f- fun of the genre, you know, put a spin mm-hmm. on it. Like, I, I think on the Halloween on Mass podcast, they, they stated that uh, <laughs> the film that has made the most money, horror film, at the box office, U.S. domestic, in North America, what would you think it is? I th- uh, scary movie, right? Scary movie, <laughs> which is insane. Yeah. It's like what? So yeah, that blows my that, mind. That, that hurt my feelings. I was just like, damn, man, it couldn't get you know. Like, I have my own issues with the first it, but I'm looking forward to the sequel. But I mean, mm-hmm. with this Halloween installment, though, I definitely had a sense of excitement. Though there was lots of stuff in it that I was uneasy with, which was cool for me. I didn't expect that. Yeah, especially the baby stuff and like the kid. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like the doctor part, though, man, that was they really got me with that part. I was like, oh, no, I think I even right. said it in the theater. I was just like, I can't believe <laughs> that this is happening. You know, I remember when that happened. My first like initial gut reaction was, whoa, holy shit, I didn't see that coming. And then once it started to sink in, I was like, no, 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 don't do this. Don't do this. I was like, no, no. But the initial shock of it got me because I just did not expect it at all. Which, you know, you appreciate because it's very hard 
to be surprised in a film these days. It really days. is. Why? It's really hard. So, I mean, like, it, it made sense to me, though. It's like he, the doc got him to Strode's because there's no way he'd yeah. be able to find that place. But the, the one plot hole, I'm not really sure. I, I, I've spoke to somebody about it, but, I mean, do you notice when the uh, the daughter breaks free of Michael after he mm-hmm. stomps on the doctor, she runs through the woods? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but does she have any problems getting onto the the Strode compound? Like she doesn't have to climb a fence; she just winds up in the you know. Yeah, you never you never see it. The what the one scene that I was like, okay, that was kind of ridiculous. How is did, when she's in the woods and she comes upon all the mannequins that Laurie's been shooting the whole movie. You know, some mates um, some mates said that's the point that she loses her mind and now she's becoming the next Michael Myers. Nah, no, thank you. Um, I know. I hope they don't do that, but you know what I'm saying though. With yeah, that last shot yeah. where she's holding the knife, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I took that as, um, you know, like the, uh, there's like the theme of the movie where Lori's constantly telling like her daughter, you know, you got to prepare yourself. This is the way the world is. And then Judy Greer gives that line about, no, the world is a loving place. And then at the end, it's Judy Greer that ends up like getting the shot that gets Michael down in the trap. So it's like Judy Greer's lesson was my mom's right. The world is not good. And having the final shot be with the knife and the daughter is that this history of violence is just like being passed down through the generations. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how I interpret the ending. I interpreted Um, her initials as kill shot. (laughs) She, (laughs) she, uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, it is a really, grim lesson to be learned in this film <laughs> right like right. your mom was right you should have uh right you should have uh, helped her stack the cans for the apocalypse when michael myers comes <laughs> but i mean and a, a I, little side note too for me with laurie is kind of off topic from that but one of the things that i found amusing is they're setting up laurie the entire movie you know to be sarah connor they show her at the range and she's getting all these headshots and she's hitting the bullseye every time and she gets her one shot in the movie <laughs> she and hit, hits him in the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And then I was expecting the movie to kind of go like the Home Alone route. Like, oh man, he's going to get in the house and she is going to fuck him up. Like, No, he got away. And I was surprised that he, for the most part he beats, beats the shit out of her. You know? <laughs> yeah, so that that's uh, it's a good point to bring up, and I guess it's an appropriate time to address this, right? So obviously, I mean, the film makes almost eighty million dollars its first mm-hmm. weekend. The, it was it ten million dollars, twenty. It probably cost nothing to make this film for these guys. They've already doubled their money. They're going yeah. to want a sequel, right? So what do they do, right? First off, they mm-hmm. got to get the same team to make it even work because when you get a different director, it's always a different feel, no matter what. Yep. Mm-hmm. So if you want to continue correctly, get those guys back. My idea is this, right? So it's the only way you can have explained <laughs> him being able to survive this death trap room that Strode sets for him mm-hmm. is to really just go full Loomis. And, you know, Loomis was right. He is the shape of evil. He is the boogeyman, you know? And, like, mm-hmm. tell it in a different way that's not like the ones that came before with, like, you know, the cult stuff, the, you know, indestructible, you know, evil powers, what mm-hmm. really is the boogeyman? What allows him to do this? Like, and they, I don't think it's ever. I mean, it's the one thing they they don't want to answer because they think that's what keeps the sequel going. But without explaining it, I, I'm not going to buy some like trap door that he goes down. Right. What do you think? I mean, like we can't do the Halloween resurrection route where she chopped off the other dude's head. Yeah, I honestly don't know how how they're going to do it. I. I <laughs> How do you and get, you know how do you get Michael back. out of that burning room? My, uh, just thinking off the top of my head, I, honestly, I haven't even thought about this. It's odd, I would right? assume, I would assume maybe you start off the film with the fire raging and somehow the locking mechanism on that cage just gets loose or melts from the flames and he just is able to bust through it. And of course you'll have him be burnt a little bit because let's face it we'll go the jaws 2 route and he'll be a little slightly burned right yeah he's slightly burned he's also missing two fingers now oh yeah oh yeah i forgot about and that and it's on his left hand uh hand and we find out that he is left-handed when in the mm-hmm. he goes into the shed he grabs the hammer with his left hand yeah mm-hmm. and i never knew that about michael until <laughs> i guess this film but yeah i imagine they I wonder, went back and looked 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious now about going back and rewatching the original. See, that's what I love about it. I've seen the original so many times, but I never really thought to pay attention to something right -handed like or that. Left -handed, yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, so like but, I, re um, I remember thinking like in the theater, like, oh shit, that's the that's the sequel like bait right there. Like yeah. there'll be something or another where she sees a guy with two fingers, and you know. And I read today too that, and I didn't know this that apparently that whole ending was reshot that. There was an original alternate ending that did screen for people. Um, yeah, that they didn't like. Yeah, and that the alternate ending was like more of like a a physical fight between Laurie and Michael. And there's a there's a shot of that real quick in the trailer. It was yeah. almost like a knife. Mm -hmm. I, I would have liked to have seen that because that's one thing I feel like they're setting Laurie up the whole movie. And it never really pays off in the way I was hoping. And another thing they said on that Slash film cast that I found was pretty funny it's a cool scene in the movie, and I love it. I think it plays mm -hmm. perfectly. It's when she's going room to room, and when she clears a room, she sends the doors down, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying on the podcast, if she knew he was in the house, why not just go around right away and just slam all those down and just catch, even if he is in a room? No, there, you there's got a couple him. of moments like that, too. I mean, like, she, she thinks to, like, I mean, I guess, like, they could argue that, you know, she wanted to get Michael inside the house, but, I mean, not protecting the glass on her front mm -hmm. door, you know, but... That whole thing, though, I mean, I don't know. The, the ending, like, it, it was like a jarring ending for me. Like, Michael is burning in there, and then they're just hitchhiking, and they get in the back of a truck, and they focus on the the generations of women, and then they mm -hmm. show the knife, and then it's the credits. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, and and yeah, I think it, they do go back jarring. for a brief moment. I mean, at least they say they do. And it, like, in all the reviews, like, oh, yeah, they showed the basement, but Michael's nowhere to be found. And you hear his breathing at the end of the credits. Like, yeah, obviously he's alive, but how? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. He ain't dead. I don't remember, I don't remember the, uh, the, burning, the burning house one more time. That's like, I see, see yeah, on Collider.com, they say that. And I don't recall that huh. myself. All I remember is just... Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to go. I, do re I did stay for... Um, the, the credits and I and I do remember the breathing being at the, which was pretty cool and Dolby because um, this is breathing That's through cool. the mask. That was something else too um, that I felt they really amped up in this was you can hear his breathing more like the original. Oh, in I the thought mask. This, just the whole soundtrack was awesome. I mean, yeah, just the way that they recorded the sound too on the set. You know, especially during that trick or treater sequence. You know, with all the noises, mm -hmm. like. Yeah. It, the one scene too, which was odd, was like you know right before he goes into the second house, the one with the baby. He he he's first looking at these two, this couple like getting in the car, and the camera stays on them for a little bit. Like he's sitting there like thinking about it, you know what I mean, and like mm -hmm. listening to them. And I, I I could watch that scene over and over again. They have like one scene, yeah. one one part of that scene on the YouTube right now, but okay, it definitely highlights for me throughout the film where where you know scattered. There's definitely some questionable stuff, but I mean. I think overall it was it was good. I think it, it you know I knew going into it there was probably gonna be some stuff that wasn't gonna sit well, but I think overall they got the feel like really right. I think Jamie Lee was great. You know, I think they got Michael Myers perfectly, you know, set the way he was. I loved all the nods to the original. Like for me, the the good outweighed the bad, so I definitely give it a thumbs up. And, Michael you know, had I'm, a huge I'm, kill count too, right? I mean like how many was it? Sixteen? Oh, yeah. Something and, and that was I loved. He had more of like a drive in this. Like you could tell, like this dude has been waiting forty years. I'm out. I'm in, in that Halloween sequence. He's like, all right, where am I going? Who? What am I? What am I doing here? All right, I'm gonna go in this house. Like, yeah. it was just so random, and you could just tell that there was like an urgency to him. But he was still the shape. Like you know, he wouldn't run, and he wasn't you know, like uh, Rob Zombie's Michael Myers. Yeah, he wasn't you know, the Incredible just, Hulk. He right. definitely had a and two, he took a beating, you know, what I mean he got hit by a car, you know, he lost two fingers, <laughs> he got shot. How many times did he get shot? Two two times? Yeah. Oh god. The, he, you know, I wanna know how he survived. So this, this is the thing the is truck. what I was saying too, is like how does he survive this stuff? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> and how could you do it in like an M night way, you know what I mean? Like a smart technical way. Right. Or something yeah, that's they, never they... been told before, you know what I mean? Like about Michael right. which gives Yeah, it's true like a new angle that mm -hmm. you never really thought of before. Yeah. Like some, but they I can't, they set it something. up that he's really not supernatural. Like they, they try to tie so many loose ends up from the first movie that, you know, Loomis, they stopped Loomis from getting him and they arrested him. You know, they kind of make it like he was this real dude that there was nothing supernatural, 
But then throughout the movie, it's like, well... Well, how's he surviving that? <laughs> exa- exactly. So, and I don't know if that's a thing that they should answer, or it's like you said, if they can come up with a really cool explanation, I, you know, I'd be curious about it, you know, because I, I, it's one thing. I don't want to see the same movie over and over and over. If you have something new and original to bring to the table that is you know, a pretty solid idea. I, I'm all for it. You know what I mean? I don't want to be sped you know, or uh, what do you go spoon fed the same bullshit. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, 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 it'll be interesting to, too, to see if Jamie Lee comes back or if they're going to do the whole passing of the torch thing, which I hope they don't because, you know, I think there's yeah. more for Stroh to do. Um, as far as like her, like if that's the other thing too. I mean, wouldn't Strode sit there and watch that house burn to the ground like at that yeah. point, you know what I mean? Like, she would have to see for herself. Yeah, they were like, that's true. they literally like the flames, and they're like, okay, late. <laughs> we'll see you later, and they they're just gone. I was just like, man, like that to me was just like that's you know you could feel like you were saying like the original ending probably had a lot more closure, but they yeah. were like, look, you mm-hmm. can't do that because you really boxed yourself in, and I guess the and ending of him know, burning like, too was a homage to Halloween too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, there was a lot of homages. The ultimate. There. They and then I'm. I love the fact that she had to burn all her belongings, including her house, you know, to you know, what she thinks, kill this guy. Like, where is she going now? Does she have, like, a backup? Does, like, she you also, too, apparently, head, that was like, your plan? tailored all the rooms to the exact set of the original with, like, the closets, you know, and the hangers and stuff. That, that was yeah. cool, too, man. We should mention that. Is the hangers, the sheets outside, and, and, the, and the film are awesome. Paying oh, homage oh, to the original. Yeah, I loved all that. I, there was a lot of cool <coughs> shots, man. Where it, was, I loved that it. it was like Lori stalking him. I was like, oh, this is great. This is. Oh yeah, that was great. This, it was such a turn, you know. Yeah, straight out the window, one... though, man. Best shot uh, of the film, though. I think mm-hmm. for me. There's a shot that I've seen. I think it's on the soundtrack. Hang on, I got the soundtrack right here. I'm pretty sure it's on the back of the soundtrack. Yeah, it is. It's a shot of like Lori standing behind like a playground set. And Michael's in the forefront, out of focus, and Laurie's standing behind him, like with a gun, just staring him down. I don't remember that in the film. Do you? I don't remember that either. No. Um, but it's a cool shot, and I'm just like, oh man, that to me is the theme of the movie right there. Like she's become the hunter, you know, and he's like oblivious to her behind him. It's a cool shot. I and I honestly don't remember it in the movie. And if it is in there, I hope it is. When I go back and see it, I want to look for it because. That, to me, is like the whole movie right there. That could have been the poster for the movie. It really could have. I can't believe it's come and gone. You know, it, it, it's mm-hmm. exciting. The, my lesson learned during the course of the anticipation of the new Halloween film is no more trailers. I know. I'm done. It's hard. I'm not spoiling really anything hard. anymore. And uh, I'm just going to have to, like, quit, like, social media <laughs> like, when it comes to that. You know, like, <laughs> I can't. I, I can't look forward to something that's spoiled, you know, and mm-hmm. I won't do it again. I really don't understand the mentality. I would love to be in a room with these people that make these decisions on the trailer. Cause you know, half the time the director doesn't even have a say in the trailer. Like I remember David Fincher got a lot of shit because he wanted to cut the trailer himself to a girl with a dragon tattoo. Mm-hmm. And I think he went through a bunch of like, he wanted to have final cut of the trailer which I, I think the I remember the trailer being like pretty badass. It was the Nine Inch Nails cover, right? Yeah. Or, it was. Uh, but um, like I, I just don't understand. Like, do they honestly think we need to see so much shit to get us into the theater? Yeah. Like, especially with Marvel films. Like every Marvel film, you know, even the ones that are not that great, still make a killing and have a fan following. Do I really need to see Captain Marvel in the full suit, you know what I mean, doing her thing? I know what she can do, but let me come to the theater and see it. Just give me a little taste. I know. Then... Just give me a tiny taste. There should be two versions of the trailer. One for the dumb audience, one for people like you yeah. and I who are cinephiles who can I really just chew never... apart the whole film like within three yeah. minutes. They'll be like, oh, well, I've, I've, n- I've never met a person. I, like, I've, I, I've never met a person that has said to me, oh, I'm not going to see that because that trailer sucked, you know. I, I don't know anyone, like, the people on the dumb side of things. Like, anyone I've ever talked to, and maybe it's just because I surround myself with people that love film, everyone always says to me the same thing. Like, oh, yeah, trailers give so much away. I'll still watch them, but... Yeah. I, I just... I just... I'm really surprised. With monies that I... Uh, monies. With movies that are just known cash cows, 
Yeah, don't Why do you have thing? don't spoil it? But you know, like I said, glass I had to cuz yeah, I could die tomorrow, Bob. I don't want you to die. I want you to stay I, living. I, I want you This I think I was saying to the, the introduction of this podcast, I think this was your fifth. I have to go back and count, but you've been on the show more times than I've actually seen you in real life now. So, <laughs> congratulations. You're the first oh, ghost. Thank you. Podcast <laughs> guest. I'll take it. Um, look, we, we could talk all night about Halloween. We could talk very well from tonight all the way up until October the 31st. But unfortunately, we're out of time here tonight on the Bobcast. Brett, I'd like to thank you very much. I know you're a huge Halloween fan. Uh, it was an honor to have you back on the show. Thanks, man. I'm a huge Bob fan as well. So thank you for having me. And I always love doing this. And um, I could talk to you for hours about this stuff. So I appreciate that you have me on. Well, thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, trick or treat coming your way soon. If you haven't seen Halloween and we spoiled it for you, well, I guess the trick's on you. My name's Bob, and this has been another episode of Bobcast.